Good evening, everybody. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What a day we have had today. And I wanted to do an impromptu Facebook and Instagram live. Thank you all for joining and um, welcome. Hey, cuz, what's going on? Hello, everybody. Um, come on in. I'll give folks a chance to join in the live. I'm on Instagram and on Facebook. Wanted to definitely um, get on here and, and share some, some things that I'm feeling and thinking and emoting over as a result of what has been going on in the country today. Um, you know, from a black male perspective. What's up, Juice? Uh, Ray Smith and all, everybody else is joining um, on Facebook Live and Instagram Live. And, and again, thank you all for joining. Please feel free to chime in. I'll try to be as responsive to your comments and, and feedback as I can, as I'm able to read them um, tonight. But uh, man, what a day. What a day we have been experiencing. What's up, C Web? What's up, uh, Jimmy Andre Boy? What's up, my cousin from another? Hey, Carla. Everybody joining in. Um, if you have been watching since about one or two o'clock this afternoon, what's been going on? Um, I've had CNN live on from the office, and the rest of my afternoon after I gotten back in my office from lunch, basically interrupted. Um, as a result of folks just seeing what was going on and emoting about what was going on. And as I was sitting in my office talking with my, my staff and team members that uh, were stopping by and sharing with me how they felt, um, it just reinforced a number of things for me as a leader of an organization. And, you know, as a, uh, I think from an innovative perspective as a CEO that I try to be, um, opening up the door and creating a platform for people to share how they feel about reality. You know, you hear from an HR perspective a lot of times, don't talk about politics and religion and, you know, certain things that might um, be challenging from a, uh, an HR perspective. But for me, um, I want to create the platform where people can talk about those things and be able to provide some sound guidance or direction or solution around it, not trying to influence people about how to feel or how to think, etc., uh, or in, enforce my own uh, uh, thoughts and feelings on people, but really want to use that as a platform for, pe for people to share and express, and to also share with people how, you know, my, my lens might help them to be more enlightened. You know, uh, I, I really wanted to talk and vent tonight about uh, how today impacted me, particularly as a black male. And as a black husband, as a black father, as a as a black leader, uh, and and you know today has really made me speechless. Um, for those of you who know me, you know it's very hard and difficult for me to not have anything to say. But today was very challenging to watch what was happening in Washington D.C. at a national building that is protected. Uh, in ways that, you know, our normal and local municipal buildings aren't. And uh, to see how protesters stormed this building in support of a president who is not ready to concede and follow a constitutionally um, uh, uh, mandated process that the country has to adhere to from a democracy perspective and, and to not... Um, step up and engage the National Guard or call for a state of emergency immediately once this crowd had uh, stepped on the premises of this building was an embarrassment. Uh, I, I, I felt uh, embarrassed. I felt um, embarrassed from the perspective of, of, of one, how this looks domestically, two, how this looks nationally, three, how this looks internationally, and how our country being a world leader in this position of power, not just domestically, but internationally, um, is being um, now viewed as a joke. And really, you know, it was very depressing. And I had, uh, you know, team members that were uh, very sad and frustrated and, and emoting 
And I had a very long conversation with one of my team members about uh, how this individual has a child that is biracial and how this has diminished the hope for this person and their child to have hope in a country where they could aspire to be anything. But now that hope is diminished by the way that our president is performing and behaving um, very childishly. And he is not concerned about anyone or anything other than himself, nor is he concerned about his rights and, and, and um, his rights to leave a good legacy from a diplomatic perspective um, as a world leader and to do so with decorum that allows the transition to be appropriate and following the path of other leaders who had to concede or had to leave office or to transition, uh, whether they wanted to or not. Uh, I, I just found it to be very pathetic. It was, you know, um, I was almost brought to tears because of me as a black man having to process all of what I saw today um, and then have to come home and, and be a husband to my wife and a father to my children and to have this conversation with them either individually or at our dinner table about how different it was a few months ago. And don't have a short-term memory, folks, because when the George Floyd riots broke out or protests broke out, um, depending on who's de de defining what it was, the National Guard and you know policing of the situation was handled much differently. And I could not help but to think and sit back and watch and say, I wonder if these individuals were black, how differently this situation would have been policed immediately. And, you know, it is um, really uh, telling about where our country is. And I also looked at this from the perspective of, you know, what if this were, if you put those pictures of what was on CNN side by side with what happened in the 1960s during the civil rights era, and folks were peacefully protesting, but yet they were uh, 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 sprayed with water hoses, beat with police batons, shot, stat, you know, all uh, uh, accosted and treated much differently. But, you know, in, in, in a few months back or a while back, folks tried to scale the, 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 the fence of the, the White House um, and didn't get any further than the fence. But how today were they allowed to get on the premises of a state uh, of, a, of a national building at the state capitol and to not only get on the premises but break windows get inside get inside the the room where the uh, proceedings were taking place get inside nancy pelosi's office not only to mention that but then inside the building have someone get shot and now that woman has died unfortunately due to being in and participating in a riot that the president of the United States uh, supported, incited, and allowed to take place without saying a word about how it should have been handled in terms of protecting the citizens of the United States. What does that say to us? And for half of the country to vote for this man and to support him and his platform, what does that say about the people that you and I engage with every day on a daily basis that have the same ideology as this man, support this man, drove miles? Because everybody who was in D.C. today protesting was not from D.C. And, you know, that's things that I think, again, as a Christian, I'm challenged because I pray for everyone. I love everyone because the Lord tells me that I need to do that. But when you know that people don't care about you, um, or see you as an equal or uh, want the same things for you that the Bible says that we ought to have compassionately and, and, and lovingly for one another. Um, and you, you, you patronize these people's businesses every day. Um, you work with some of them. Some of them are on your boards and, 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 and of your organizations or, you know, they, they fund these efforts but yet they work in the communities in which we live and serve. It is a very sad state because where does that leave us? And then to compound that with COVID 
and other issues that are going on in our community, it, it, it really has left me today at a very challenged space. But to God be the glory, because, you know, without the Lord, I truly feel that I would not be able to handle the situation that I am going through. And, and again, you know, it is it, it's very challenging for, for me. And I, I can only speak for Jamal because, as, again, as a black male, not just what I saw today um, was very telling, but it really challenges me to do something with what I saw today and really helps me to try to identify some type of focus around, you know, what happens from, from here uh, going forward and, and what we can band together and do. And just a couple things that comes to mind, I think uh, uh, a glimmer of hope is that the Georgia election results were favorable to the Democratic Party winning the House. Or, or winning uh, uh, their, that, that part of the election. I don't know if it's the House or Senate. I can't think right now. Um, but uh, having that control to support the platform of the new administration, I think, is going to be important. But what can we do? Well, vote. Stay engaged. Do whatever it is that is appropriate in your local areas because, again, uh, real estate matters and what's what happens locally is very important about what's going to happen on the national front and stay engaged. These next two years are going to be extremely important that we stay engaged with what happens in this new administration. And then don't take your foot off the gas because in the midterm elections, you have to get out and vote. You have to get out and support and pay attention to what these politicians who are opposing what needs to go on. Uh, vote them out of office. We have to use our vote as our voice and get these people out of office that don't care about our country and our constituents from a moral and ethical perspective. These people have more trust and reliability in this man, meaning Trump, than they do in the Constitution in which they are supposed to serve as an elected official. And you see that being demonstrated right now. We cannot have a short-term memory as it relates to that. And if we don't do what we can do during this next two years and beyond, we are a part of the problem. We really need to make sure that we're doing what we need to do and what we can do. And, and voting, whether it's at your school district level, your, your, your local level, your, um, uh, your, your city council, your state elected officials, your regional officers and, and people who are, are controlling funding that comes into your neighborhoods, you really, we need, really need to be engaged in that process as it moves forward because it is impacting black and brown communities in ways that we cannot any longer be passive about. And we have been in the past. Let's call it what it is. Uh, and, and, and I'm not saying that from, from a, a, you know, all of us perspective, but where we do that individually, it impacts the greater number. And if we do not band together around some type, some type of uniform plat unified platform or ways to impact change and learn what's going on in our local neighborhoods and communities and do something about it by, by voting, but also participating, joining our, uh, our parent teacher associations and, and going to city council meetings about different things that are happening in your communities and getting engaged, holding these elected officials accountable for what they are legislating that impact us on a daily basis. You've seen it today in what was happening in Washington, D.C. There's a white privilege. There's a white privilege that allowed those individuals to fight against the police officers in D.C. that were trying to police the situation. If those individuals were black, they would have been maced, shot, and that crowd would have been disbanded in a very much more rapid pace than what we, we saw today. That was so disheartening because what that was was it, it showed us that um, white privilege exists. Systemic racism is very prevalent and evident and that every person, well, it, it, imagine if that was a Muslim group that was out there protesting. Imagine if that was a, an, an LGBT crowd that was out there protesting. If, if that was a group of African Americans that went out there and, and really tried to force their way into the state capitol. Again, 
the outcome, it would have been a bloodbath out there. And we all know that that's a reality. And, and again, people may, you know, get turned off about me for, for talking about what's true. And I really don't care about that at this point, because again, as a black male trying to build a better community and future for my myself, my people, and my family, and my children, and the community in which we live, you know, we have to step up and stand up and say what's right and call, you know, everything uh, uh, as it is, as the Bible teaches us to do. You know, we need to, uh, and, and the fact that many of these people who were there are people that we potentially engage with, work with, live nearby, or, you know, or, or support their businesses, get our cars fixed at their, 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 their locations, you know, that is so disheartening to me, uh, and 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 it 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 it, it plagues me because I'm thankful that we saw what we saw today, but I'm disappointed that we saw what we saw today because now we know who some of these folks are, um, and 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 can identify them and know that the issue that we 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 have exists. But at, yeah, yes, Kamar, you're absolutely right, man. It is in the fiber of America's DNA. You know, again, the Constitution was written by a group of white males, you know, and it was not inclusive of women. It was not inclusive of people of color. Uh, so the laws in which that which govern our, our, our country are laws that were developed from a, a, a singular, uh, singularly focused mentality and perspective and lens. And when it extracts or does not include, you know, different perspectives, of course, it's not going to be all comprehensive. And, you know, again, we are governed by those laws. We are, are led by those laws. And, you know, it's a shame that um, much of what has been going on since the beginning of our country is still existing today. Uh, and no matter what advancements we have made as a country, no matter what advancements we've made as a people, we still, those who are underrepresented, underserved, African-American, Latino, minorities, whoever you are in that population that is not equitably uh, viewed or treated in this country, um, you know, we are plagued by the laws that are in place. And, you know, again, in, in the exercising of the First Amendment right today, as you saw, again, if it were other cultures that had done the same darn thing, it would not have been the same darn outcomes. And, you know, which leads into, you know, I was having a conversation with someone the other day about the Second Amendment uh, rights. You know, the Second Amendment rights from, from some folks perspective was put in place just in case the First Amendment right uh, goes south. And, you know, with that in mind, you know, there's inequity around that, around how society has always plagued minority communities with not being treated equitably when we decide to exercise our Second Amendment rights. And, you know, it's unfortunate. You know, if a whole bunch of black folks jumped out there today and joined NRA, I guarantee you that amendment as well as the gun laws in this country would change immediately um, because it was not ever designed for minorities or African Americans to have the same uh, access and outcomes as others in this country. And it's very sad, uh, you know, from, from that perspective. Um, and, and, you know, uh, it, it is, you know, Richard, I disagree, man. Uh, it is, it is, um, white privilege, uh, because the white privilege allowed what happened today to be policed and handled differently than what happened when the Black Black Lives Matter protests were going on and when the George Floyd protests were going on. I can give you an example in Philadelphia when, and, and you should know this because you live in Philly, um, when the riots broke out. Um, or, or not riots, they were protests. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm he sorry. He agreed. can't say it's not. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I misread your comment, uh, uh, Richard. Um, I, I apologize because I thought you said that. Uh, um, uh, I'm sorry. I, I misread your comment. But uh, in, in Philly, I'll give that example still. When we arrived in Philly, as the protests were just starting in Philly around the George 
Floyd um, situation, um, they immediately, immediately called in the National Guard to police urban areas. And I had never in my life experienced helicopters flying over at all hours of the night and day and having military uh, tanks at the corner of every block that we drove down in Philly um, and, and you know, uh, seeing them with military weapons and tanks and things in urban neighborhoods and police at every corner, fire trucks being overturned and different things happening in the neighborhood. I, 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 I was so perplexed at how fast this changed the West Philadelphia area where we happened to be at the time. And um, to, to not see that happen just as fast in D.C. today, it blew my mind because I'm saying West Philadelphia is not even a national area that is regarded, you know, as the national, the, the, the capital of the United States. And they did all of this in our little neighborhood area in West Philly, but didn't do a microcosm of that during the time that I'm watching CNN in Washington, D.C. Embarrassing. How do I explain that to my children? How do I explain that to my team members who are coming in my office and, and having, you know, uh, emotional um, uh, reactions to what they're seeing, you know, and, and as, a, as again, as a black man, as a leader, as a father, as a husband, it is, uh, you know, it's a challenge that, um, you know, I, I could put no words to, you know, I was getting texts by a number of my friends and we're going back and forth about, you know, how ridiculous what we were watching was taking place. And, and again, the, the ultimate thing that really broke my heart today was that somebody died. You know, a, a woman got shot um, in the midst of what was going on. I'm, I'm not sure and can't, uh, you know, uh, equip or, or make out whether or not she was a protester. I'm assuming that she was. Um, and, and irrespective of whether she was or not, no one deserves to die. Um, but this president is responsible for that woman's death because he encouraged he incited, um, he he supported, and he did not dismiss or disband or dispel or even call in the resources to protect people. So, you know, that woman's life and her death is now charged to the, 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 the um, how much this man um, has done to create this type of dissension in the office that has been held in such a high regard, both locally, domestically, and internationally. Um, uh, uh, people's uh, reaction to things, I, and, and I, I'm not trying to figure that out. I mean, the the the, the, the I, I'm just venting and sharing. I'm not trying to understand why people um, react the way that they do, or or have responded in such a way. Like I said, to me, it is a blessing because it's telling. And it's showing us where we are as a country. It's showing us the character of individuals that we live, work, and play around with every day. And I think, again, what I said earlier is, is important and key to me. What do we do with what we're learning today? And are, first of all, are we learning anything from what we're seeing today? Uh, 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 and, and what are we doing? What are we going to do with what we've learned from what we see today? And you're absolutely right. This has been shown to us since we arrived on the grounds of this country, you know, from how we were treated as less than a person, how they viewed us as three fifths of a person. How do you write a, a, a law or or even articulate that a human being is less than a human being in the service and in or the uh, fiber of the country that we helped to build and that we supported, you know, and. But but what are we going to do, Kamari? You know, it's not that we haven't learned, but, you know, what are we going to do? You know, how do we band together for an equitable outcome? You know, how do we unify around one agenda as a people to build our own economy where we can stand up against what's going on uh, in this in this country that we know has been 
unbalanced since day one, you know, and, and how do we get to a point um, where we are educated enough to to do what we haven't done related to the, the ignorance that's there. That's right, you know, and equity does not exist. That's why we're having this conversation. Um, you know, as a diversity practitioner as well, you know, that's one of the things that I argued for and against and, and, and tried to champion and advocate for in every organization that I work to do this type of work because of the fact that there there is no equity. There's no equity as it relates to health. You know, there's health disparities. The black community is always below beneath uh, other, other um, cultures and races and ethnicities because of the fact that the systemic racism exists and systematic racism exists and organizational racism exists and there's always inequity. If you look at it from a workforce perspective, a health perspective, a community perspective, a health outcomes perspective, gentrification, uh, redlining, I mean, there, you name it, black people, minorities have always been at the suffering end of all of it. But what are we gonna do with what we learned, what we know, and what has been going on since the beginning of time? When do we get to a point where we say enough is damn enough? You know, when do we get to a point where we start to stand up and say and do what we need to do from a, not just a protesting perspective, but from the boardroom perspective and from, uh, you know, uh, being in the conversations that drive change perspective and doing it in such a way where it has impact and not just you know, uh, it, it's the thing that happens for the moment, but not for the movement. And, you know, I, I pray for a day on Willie that we can have that, you know, and I don't want to, to look at it from the perspective that it'll never be. And, you know, because again, that's, that's why I get depressed or that's why I get angry or that's why I get frustrated because I feel that it can't happen, but yet I have to have hope that it can happen. And that's what will, I think be my motivation from a day-to-day -day basis to try to make something happen, but we can't do it alone. Uh, and, and, and we can't do it in a vacuum. Right, right, uh, Ralph, you know, we cannot be afraid to stand up, but you know what makes us afraid to stand up? And I'm going to say this because it's a true reality that I've seen happen too often. We won't stand up in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our communities, on our jobs, because we fear the consequence. We fear saying something on our job when it ain't right because we fear losing our job and our livelihood. But if we had a support system that said, hey man, if you're doing the right thing and you're a black leader, we got your back if you lose your job. We're gonna keep you and your family whole. We're gonna make sure that you're taken care of because you standing up to do what's right for a greater good for the folks that don't have the position that you have or don't have the voice that you have and and, and, and and we got you, absolutely. That's the problem because we got too much me, my, or mine mentality as we go into that and oh, I'm just gonna sit here and take what I'm gonna need to take from this boss that is you know, a, a bully and treating black people differently than he or she treats white people or females different than he treats males and since I'm in this role, I'm going to stand up and say something, but I'm not going to fear the consequence because I know that by doing the right thing, that the right things are going to happen for people that I need to step up for who don't have the voice or the seat or the bully pulpit that I have. And that's the problem. We're too afraid of losing our livelihood. And then there's no safety net for us in our community that we can fall back on that says, we're not only going to take care of you, we're going to stand behind you because of what you stood up for. And that's what we need to create as a community, as a culture, where that is, that is the common practice culturally, and we are able to support one another to be able to make these changes. But it will never happen until we start doing things like that. And we have to stop being afraid. You know, we have to remove the fear. We have to also trust in the Lord with all our heart, leading not up to our own, our own understanding. I think once we get to that point where we trust God more than we trust the job, trust God more than we trust man, trust God more than we trust our paycheck, trust God more than we trust the circumstances that we see happening in and around us, and really look at what God says and, and believe God at his word and trust the spirit of God that nudges us 
when those situations occur that we need to step up and speak up for, um, when we do that, that's when I think the change that we are not experiencing can happen. And again, I said this last week in the Facebook Live that I did, I think COVID was a great example that the Lord used to really put us all on the level platform about being able to trust him. And, you know, uh, I, I, I believe that we've lost that passion and that desire to trust the Lord the way that we, we, we need to be. And, and V, I, I, I'm, I'm that, same, that same guy. Uh, and I, I, I think God flipped the switch when I turned 45 because I have less patience and tolerance for bullshit. And I'm saying that very candidly um, because that's the reality. You know, again, I cannot tolerate the BS anymore. And I, I, I've lost the, the, the passion to be patient with foolishness. Um, and, and really not so much from a rebel perspective, but really looking at things from a, a, a perspective of what is it really going to take to drive change? If you look at the 1968 health uh, disparities report is no different now in 2020 than it was in 1968 from a numbers perspective. And, when, and what, what that means to me is that we haven't changed. You know, you look at some of the slavery mentality that was put in place back in 1619. A lot of that is still in place now. No matter what you drive or where you live or how much money you make, there's still a slavery mentality in this country that we have not gotten out from under since it was put in place. And it was put in place for a purpose. And that purpose was to play people that were not of a certain culture and race. And that's us in most cases. And what are we going to do about it? You know, again, my man uh, Jamal Mack said to me earlier today, you know, uh, we've been talking enough. And, you know, what are we going to do? And that, that's the question that I leave with you all tonight. What are we going to do? You know, again, what was evident in D.C. today, we got a new president. We got the first black mixed female vice president who has the potential to um, to, to be a, a president at some point. If the country is ready for that and voters support that, you have the now controlled house that will support um the uh the the presidency and and this platform and we have that opportunity to drive change that way um we had historic election results all of these positive things that i believe god is showing us because if you think about um the the way that these elections and election results have turned out i think about romans 13 and it talks about how god puts those in authority in place so god is in control of who's in office and you know um I am just challenged to, to, to say, what are we going to do to make sure that we're not having the same conversation two years from now or four years from now or eight years from now? And what are we going to do to build a better legacy for our children, our families, our household, our, our communities? What are we going to do to change our jobs, our organizations in our communities that we, that we patronize or work for that have racist uh, leaders and or racist um, practices? and or persist or, or perpetuate some of the racist activities that have been going on for years. What are we going to do? What are we going to do different? Um, you know, uh, we can't run from it, you know, and Kamari posed a very interesting question. How can you get up from the master when you want to be the master? You know, first of all, you have to learn how to serve, I believe, because if you learn how to serve, you can learn how to lead. And in learning how to serve and learning how to lead, that allows you to be in a position where you can change getting out from under the master and becoming the master, but you cannot have a dual agenda. It has to be singularly focused, I believe, as it relates to how you impact change. And one of the things that I've always, um, in recent changes uh, of careers and, 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 and things that, um, that uh, the Lord has blessed me to do, I've learned to pray that God will put me in a position where I can serve no matter what my title is. And you're right, Ralph, you know, it's not about being an HNIC and ain't about, you know, being a CEO. I mean, those things are great when it happens, but let the Lord guide you to that. And, but you have to, in any role, whether you are the person that cleans the, the, the building or the person that serves the lunch or the person that is in the C-suite, you have to be a servant. And I think that, again, there's only one master, which is Jesus, in my estimation, you know, and you can't 
be better or higher than him. He said in his word, greater things than these you shall do. Uh, but that is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me as well, that supports that. And you have to be a servant in all that you do in order to be a change agent. And you never know what the Lord will do through you when he's allowed to use you in whatever space that you're in. But I think that once we all get at that platform, that's when a lot of this change that we say uh, kind of negatively won't ever change. That's when it'll change. And that is us really getting to a point where we can humble ourselves and get together on one platform. And that platform is what the Lord's agenda is uh, to, to, to do what needs to happen and, and really to trust God for, for, for what he is calling us to do uh, in, in the roles in which we are blessed to serve in on a daily basis. So, Kamari, what you talking about? Um, then, you know, because that's what I got from your question. But, you know, I, I, I think I hear you as well because it's that competition within the spaces in which we run um, to try to really hold back the progress of the, the, the larger majority versus our individual success. And if, I, if I'm hearing you right and, you know, knowing who you are, I think that that's what you uh, might have been asking. Well, ask your darn question then if, you, if you're going to ask a question and throw it out there. Say what you're talking about so that, you know, we don't have to play the guessing game with you, uh, Mr. EA. Um, so, so say more about that. When you talk about the slave master, how do we get out from under the slave master if we want to be the master? Say more about what, what, you're, trying, what you're trying to get at um, because I think that that's an important question. But even still, I think what I had shared um, earlier, still from the perspective of what we struggle with as a community for why we cannot unify, why we can't move forward, why we can't, you know, make the changes that are necessary are, are, are related to that. And, you know, again, it, it, it is a, a challenge that we face each and every day. Um, and, you know, as a black male, we have that crab in the barrel mentality. You know, no one wants to really see uh, a, another person be five cent more rich than they are. Uh, you know, and you hear people make comments like, well, you don't need all that. And, you know, uh, why are you doing all that? And, you know, who are you trying to impress and things like that, that people say to you when you are just blessed and, and you have what the Lord says is yours because you are obedient to the things that he's called you to do. And, you know, like I said before, the, the thing that I am um, at a place in my life that I, I think is, is truly a blessing to in a blessed space to be is that I can care less what people say about Jamal and what people think about Jamal. Uh, because I know if I'm doing what the Lord told me to do and I'm obedient to him, then he's the only person that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, what he has to say. And I only want to hear him say one thing, which is well done, that good and faithful servant. And, you know, again, when you weight that against the, the hate and the messages and, and stuff that people try to put against you, it, I, I'm not concerned about that. But that is very challenging when you hear that in your own community. But then when you see what happened in D.C. today and you really realize that these are the same people who think the same about you, uh, um, that you're hearing in your own community, it makes it that much more perplexing. Uh, Ralph said, we come together to get out of the slave mentality. Great example is look at the Jewish community. Yep, uh, they help each other in professional environment, personal needs hold steadfast in their faith, and when one wins, the other community wins. I, I totally agree, Ralph. Uh, I had the, the blessed privilege in Philly to work with a group of folks um, that were, it, they called it the Black and Jewish Talks. So they brought together a bunch of young uh, black leaders and a bunch of young Jewish leaders and brought us together to develop a group that would be future leaders for the uh, city of Philadelphia. What we learned about each other was, you know, very, you know, where our similarities were as a culture and where our differences were as a culture. And what I saw that came out of that was how did you hardly ever ever, if at all, hear about uh, someone in the Jewish community um, going through some of the challenges publicly um, that others are ridiculed or that happen in other communities, etc. And what I also learned was that 
if a Jewish person needs something, it's taken care of within their community. Um, they may tap into external resources outside of their community to fuel what happens inside their community, but the need is always met. If a person needs a car, a job, or something like that, or is in transition, uh, or you know having challenges, whatever that person needs from that community takes place in that community. What I also learned was that their synagogue is a center point for what happens in their community. What I took from that was what I try to take back to my community. One, our church, our synagogue uh, has to be the circumference of where those needs are met. But then two, why can't we create an infrastructure in the black community that takes care of any issue that happens in the black community? And it goes back to what I said. If I speak up at my job and say something that pisses everybody off on the job because it's the right thing to say and the right thing to do and I lose my job, where's my safety net? Where do I go in my community to help keep me whole until I find my next opportunity? And or how does that group that takes care of my need make sure that I, my next opportunity comes from inside that group? And you're right, uh, Ebony, the, the Asian culture does it well as well. Um, you know, you see how they can open a business and everyone in the family lives in one household and is all responsible generationally to ensure that, you know, the grandmother takes care of the family and does all of the cooking while the able bodies who work go out and they work at the business that the family owns or the businesses that the family owns and they bring all of those resources back into that house to support however many people are living there. The Hispanic community does that to a degree as well. But again, we don't band together, I think, as a culture uh, this in similar ways that we could then thrive and start to make some of those changes that you're, 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 you're talking about, Kamari and Ralph. Um, and um, it, you're right, Breeze. You know, that it is how structured those cultures have been for generations. And, you know, again, we got to get out of our own way. Um, we got to think differently. We have to act differently. We have to respond differently. And, and Kamari, I know you got to jump off of your thing a little bit, man. But, um, you know, I, I this is Kamari is a friend of mine and we've been friends since 1993. And he is a financial whiz and guru. And, uh, you know, I, I think um, a lot of what he talks about, uh, his, his platform is the financial rebel can help us, but we fear, um, you know, making those changes and investments and doing things differently. We don't trust each other. Like my wife said, you know, um, because we weren't taught to do that, you know, and society pits us against each other. I, I, I will never forget, um, in an executive role, I, I walked into a room with the person I reported to and we both were, you know, dressed the way that we dress. And one of the other leaders, excuse me, had the nerve to say, oh, look at you two. Uh, uh, so who's who's going to win the best dressed award? And, you know, uh, which which one of you are, you know, um, are, are more into, you know, fashion than the other one? And we were like, what? Like, first of all, we're, we're not competing against each other you know, for that shine or whatever it is that you're, you're trying to do. But it's just, you know, those subliminal things that people will do at times to try to pit you culturally against each other without even knowing that those things are taking place. And I think we have to be attuned to that. Um, but society does that at a, at a larger scale. You know, uh, they, they teach us to be competitive against each other. They teep, teach us to have the crab in the barrel mentality. Then they try to promote the, you know, you need to be the only one in the room because you're the smartest one. And, and when you speak, you speak for the whole group and community. And we take that to head and to heart. And we want to exclude people from being out of that space because we want to be the only person in that room. And I thank God that I don't have that mentality. I want us as a people to thrive. When I have more people in the room that looks like me, then I have different perspectives and then we can come to, together collectively to represent the culture or the group or the race or the ethnicity that we represent 
And having more than one person in the room gives balance. Having more than one person in the room expresses diversity. Having more than one person in the room gives strength to the community that has been underrepresented. But we don't see it that way, <clears throat> you know, because we want to be the only one in the room sometimes. And, and again, I'm not knocking, but I'm just calling out what the realities are. And if that hits a person because I threw a brick in a crowd, you know, then again, you were meant to get hit. But we don't have, I'm sorry, Kamari, right, 1989, longer than that. I'm so, I, I said 93, I'm thinking about um, um, uh, when, <laughs> when we graduated. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is just amazing, folks, that in 2020, it doesn't look any different than 1968 or the, the early 1960s or 1619 when we see images of, of slaves with uh, tattered backs because of being whipped um, and beaten uh, or sprayed with fire hoses uh, because we were trying to make sure that folks had the right to vote. And, you know, uh, it, it, it is, again, it has broken my heart today uh, to see that people were able to do um, things that I believe Jamal Boyd and, and other black folks that I know would not be allowed to do. Uh, you would be planning my funeral if I were one of those protesters at, that, you know, we went down and, and did what other folks were able to do today. Uh, and and it, not that I would want to do anything as asinine as storm the Capitol building. But if I did, I know that my fate and outcome would be much different. And, you know, what type of legacy are we building for our black and brown children? Uh, what type of hope do we give to them and to others that they are not like those folks, but that the country uh, stands against that type of stuff when the country allow that type of stuff to happen? Um, you know, uh, we, we do have a big issue with trust breeds. Um, and and uh, Stacy, you're, you're you're right. You know we we are our worst critics um, instead of being our best supporters. You know we would rather snatch somebody's crown off their head than to straighten it up if it's crooked um, as a people. And that's just sad. You know it, it, it's sad. We have to get to a point where we say enough is enough. Today was one of those enough is enough days for me uh, a, a, as an individual. And I pray, my prayer is that um, we don't lose momentum, that we don't uh, get stagnated, that we really champion around what we've seen and what we've learned and what we can do um, differently from today going forward. Because if the Lord lets us see tomorrow, it's another opportunity. And I try to and am trying to have that mentality with the opportunities that I have left, however many days the Lord gives me on this on this planet to continue to do whatever he allows me to do and gives me the strength to do. What can I do? What should I do? And try to take my cues from him and, and pray that he positions me with an opportunity to do something. Uh, and, and like I said, first, always as a servant, but then if God gives me a platform and a voice of authority and power that I don't fear saying or doing what's right because I'm concerned about you know, what my board might think or what uh, individuals and in my organization might think or what my neighbors and friends might think, um, you know, but as long as I'm doing what the Lord says I should do and I'm trusting him for covering the circumstances and even the vengeance, if it needs to be there, um, that I'm doing what needs to happen and I'm doing the right thing. And I pray that you're challenged the same way to do that, you know, and, and again, if we can band together and get these resources that we talk about are lacking in our community. Uh, I, I believe everything that we we need is in the house, um, but we don't trust each other enough to bring that together. Um, and and uh, we have to get through some of these battles that we fight, not just in external communities, but within our own communities, because that's where some of the biggest challenges occur, you know, around our own people who don't wanna see progress happen because they're not progressive or they're stuck at a place where, you know, they can only see what they saw. And 
by that I mean, you know, they, they only know what happened in their family, you know, and, and don't want to or can't see beyond what happened generationally or, or familially uh, in their own space to, to have change occur. And then, you know, we, we go to work and we face it. We go out into our communities and face it. You know, I had shared with one of my boys, we were texting earlier today, I am licensed to carry and been licensed to carry since I think about 2001. And when I lived in Philadelphia, I probably carried my gun every day um, because of how unsafe it was. And I was doing events, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and carrying, you know, money and things like that. And it was just the culture. It was just a norm. I would put my suit on and get dressed and put my gun in my, in my waist every day. Uh, but when I moved to Ohio in 2013, in between 2013 and 2019, 2020, I probably carried my gun five times and that's probably being generous. But now in 2020, with all of this racial tension and everything else that was going on, I've been carrying my gun at least one or two every day. And I'm not saying that from a bragging perspective, and I'm not saying that to invoke or, or bring any uh, special types of attention my way. It's just that as a black male, I feel that I need to now protect myself and my family in different ways that I didn't have to years ago. And exercising my Second Amendment rights as, as a citizen uh, to, to do so. And I don't apologize for that. Um, but never have I thought that I would need to have to carry my gun in an area where the quality of life is much different than where I was raised and where I grew up and where we lived for the majority of my life. And that to me is a telling sign, you know, um, and it, it, it's a shame that I have to do that. It's a shame that I have to uh, uh, be at the range once a week or twice a month uh, practicing uh, my skills to make sure that if I'm approached or when I'm approached, you know, that I'm able to defend myself, you know, because somebody might challenge me just because I made that that statement. And that's OK, but I'm, it's not going to be an easy win. Just know that, <laughs> you know, but um, it, it, the, the, the fact that in 2020, I have to have that type of mentality um, it is embarrassing. It's shameful. It's it's you know, it, it, it's mind blowing to me um, because as I get older, I would think that I would need to regress on some of these types of things. Um, but, you know, it's unfortunate that that's where we are. But as of yesterday, Ohio has also now extended and expanded its uh, stand your ground laws, which makes it even more incumbent upon me to need to carry my weapon because I don't want to run up against one of these idiotic people who now at no just cause feels as though that they need to defend themselves against me, who's a model citizen, a, a leader in my church, my community and my, my, you know, my, my home. And, you know, I'm just trying to make it back home every day. Um, so, you know, that's the, the, the society in which we live. And today was just so indicative of how unbalanced that is and how more vigilant I and we need to be and how much more on top of our game and walking circumspect and paying attention to the signs that God is showing us through how these, you know, and I, I don't want to call people idiots, but they're idiots. Anytime that you cannot see that what you are supporting is not morally and ethically correct and that you have more trust and faith in a man who is not a model of leadership uh, than in things that are right. And even from, if you look at, from a, look at it from an, a, a, a constitutional perspective, in the eyes of democracy, the right thing to do is what needs to happen according to the laws that were put in place that put you in office. And when you cannot do that as an elected official, when you can't step aside, when you can't concede, when you can't notice that you've lost, um, and you're gonna do everything to thwart the process, when you challenge science, this man has put so much fear in the country and in the world around being vaccinated against a virus that has killed over 250,000 people um, and impacted millions around the world. Uh, when you challenge science and not step out the way and let people who are much more intelligent than you do their job, how do you support someone like that? How do you show up in numbers in Washington to try and overturn what the country said needs to happen? 
And when you support that, you're not smart. You can't be smart. You could have voted for him for whatever reason, and I'm not knocking that. I don't care who you voted for, Republican, Democrat, or Independent, but when you support the platform and, and, and the games and the, the, uh, the, 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 the just how much of the insanity that this man promotes and exudes, then that speaks a lot to your character. And again, I, 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 I'm not trying to offend anybody, but if you're offended by that, then again, it should hit you that way. Because again, we don't. We, I'm, I'm not saying we all make great decisions about who we vote for, and you have to choose if you're going to vote who you vote for. But when you vote for someone that does not reflect even many of the people that voted for him, he doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about your family. He doesn't care about your culture. And then this exodus strategy to try and get people $2,000 stimulus checks. D again, don't be caught up in the moment. Think about the last four years and how what his presidency has done for you or not. And if you are in that privileged group of folks that benefited from his presidency, then God bless you. But at the same time, what then are the residual impacts of that? And then what does then that say about you, about how you feel about the rest of the people who did not benefit the way that you did from his presidency? I, I'm gonna get off my, 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 my platform here and, and you know, I, I just, I, I I have never in my life uh, experienced such a um, disappointing day in American democracy and, and, and what we've seen displayed here in our country. And I just hope that folks are paying attention to what was larger than what we saw. Uh, and, and working in the mental and the behavioral health and the uh, addiction treatment or substance use disorder space um, as a leader, um, I saw more of what I believe, even from our president, uh, is a mental health issue that is unaddressed. And that's why I pray for him. Um, because even in some of the tweets that he sent out, this man is completely disconnected from reality. And, you know, it's very unfortunate to see. And it's not anything to laugh about because that could be somebody in your household. That could be you. That could be somebody in your family. And that's where I think the Lord gives us sensitivity around uh, what's really happening. And again, don't just respond and react to the hell that you saw breaking out today on TV. Look at it from a grander perspective of what the Lord is trying to teach us about people's mental state, people's uh, 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 mentality about how they view other people who are human beings, who are, are you know, just as equal as them, uh, and, but we don't see or treat them that way. Pray for them. Pray for our country. Pray for our leaders. Pray for everyone. Pray for the woman's soul who died uh, today because unfortunately, you know, she was there to support this man and the blood of her life and soul is on his hands. Um, and, and I pray that the Lord will cover him for that. Uh, and we have to have compassion, Ralph, for others, right? You know, we have to have compassion for other people or else we, this is never going to change. And again, I think we have to see it from the way that the Lord wants us to see it versus the way that we saw it. And, and when we get there, that's when true change occurs. Uh, you know, I, I pray for everyone uh, who joined tonight. Thank you all for joining and those that might watch this at a later time. Uh, you know, I was just venting. Uh, it was no structure, no format tonight. I, I just felt compelled to, to share what was on my heart. I'm still a little uh, just baffled, confused, and um, frustrated, angry, um, sad, disappointed, uh, a number of adjectives that I'm sure many others are feeling. Uh, I, I don't know what to do from here, but I do know what I am going to do is pray about it and leave it with the Lord and ask the Lord for guidance and direction. Uh, because without that, I would be a basket case. Uh, I am going to also have me a nice glass of wine and relax. I, because I did this, I, would, I wasn't able to, to have a bath and soak and just, you know, uh, uh, meddle in my thoughts. But um, I, I, I'm going to enjoy the rest of my evening and just kind of reflect and talk with my wife and kids about this day and, you know, pray that tomorrow will be a better day if the Lord allows us to see it. Um, but pray over these next 14 days as well, y'all, um, because, excuse me, I'm concerned about the inauguration. I'm concerned about the inauguration day. 
I'm concerned about the next two weeks that I, I really hope that they exercise the 25th Amendment and get this wacko out of office uh, and, and, and remove him before uh, you know anything else happens or more lives are lost through protests. And um, I, I um, yeah, D. Lee, um, I um, know that they said that Congress was going to conclude this process even if they had to do it in, in, in one of those rooms. So I, I am about to um, turn CNN on as well while I have my glass of wine and, and watch what is going to unfold for the rest of the night. But thank y'all for participating in this, this conversation uh, and allowing me to, to vent and, and kind of um, <laughs> uh, um, just express my um, all over the place thoughts Thank y'all for your comments and everybody who chimed in. Um, uh, I will say this kind of jokingly, but seriously, um, and, and I say this more for you know everybody, but particularly my wife and the women out there, go out and get your gun uh, permit. Go out and get licensed to carry. Learn about the appropriateness of gun purchase, use, and its um, intent to protect yourselves and your families and be safe um, because we don't know and we can't control what other people think about you, us, and or might do to you or us as a result of what they think about you or us. And it is not ever our intent to take a life, but self-preservation is first. And I encourage you to preserve yourselves for the sake of your family. If you're a mother and you have children, think about protecting yourselves and the babies that God has blessed you with uh, and to protect and care for. Uh, and, and men, you know, it's nothing wrong with protecting yourself in your home and particularly black men because society has taught us that it is a criminalized act to own a gun and to protect yourself. And if the Second Amendment was written for all Americans and all who are under the constitutional law, that includes you. So do not feel embarrassed. Do not let anybody tell you any different. Protect yourself and protect your family and there's nothing wrong with that. Get trained, get educated, get licensed and protect yourself, your home and be vigilant about protecting yourself. You know, pay attention to when you're out and about and how people are looking at you and your surroundings and different things and areas that you go into. Um, it's nothing wrong with exercising the need and the right to protect yourself. And I, I just, um, you know, pray that and, and let Ebony, yeah, right. Um, um, I, <laughs> you, I'm, I'm going to talk to you when I leave, get out the office. But, uh, you know, again, I, I just encourage us to take that more seriously, particularly in these times. Uh, and, and I say that um, from a very serious perspective, uh, just because it, it ain't safe. Uh, and, you know, never have I would imagine that I would be saying something like this in a public forum and encouraging people, but I don't apologize for that because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and, and again, whether you've had fear of guns, learn about them and or, you know, uh, get educated. There's tons of education out there around guns and gun safety and gun purpose and, and, and what to do and how to use them and all of those things. And then once you get over the fear, get over the sound, you know, go out and practice and, 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 and get over how that sound and the impact and then learn how to be accurate uh, and, and have different types of, of weapons to protect yourself in any situation, whether it's mace, a knife or a gun or a baton or a baseball bat or whatever it is but learn how to be tactically prepared to, pr to protect yourself in your home, in your family. Uh, it just as if you had a fire in the home, you got smoke detectors and you, you, you should have a, a plan to get out the house if a fire broke out, do the same as it relates to protecting yourself and your family and, and your surroundings. So that's it, I, I'm gonna get off uh, because I, I, I could go on all night about these things. And again, I, I, I love all of you. Uh, and I, I mean that from a genuine perspective, that's why I don't mind putting my heart on the line and, and I pray that whatever the Lord allowed me to share and to, to give to you tonight, that it has blessed each of you in some shape or form uh, going forward. Y'all be blessed. Keep me in prayer. Keep our families in prayer. Keep 
you know, this country in prayer, pray for our leaders, pray for our organizations, and pray for change. Uh, pray that we have true change, um, particularly for the black community, uh, so that we are, are striving towards equity and getting towards a place where we have better outcomes as a people. Be blessed. Take care. Love y'all. Have a great evening.